Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm so glad uh, that you guys are here this morning. I just want to welcome a lot of our people who went on holiday and they said you can watch us online. So uh, all the guys that's in Durban, wherever you find yourself, welcome. And I trust this morning that you will lean with your spirit man into this message. The last two weeks we talk about understanding the gospel of Christ. What is good news? Good news is not that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The good news is by His redemption work on a cross, we are the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. We are the light and the salt. We, are, we died with Christ, rose with Christ, and we are seated in heavenly places with Him. So this morning I'm going to preach about understanding your threefold metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is just a term that we are using this year in our Wednesday evenings. It means change. It means transformation. God wants to change you. Romans 12 starts with the identification of the gospel of Christ, the pathway, the concept of being a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Amen? So metamorphosis is to change. And I pray this morning that this message will change your mindset concerning your ways in Christ Jesus. Remember the theme of this year is to build. God wants to build something in you that will bring a foundation, a solidness in the season of our lives. All this term well, God says I want to build. So this morning, understanding, say understanding. And this is what I'm going to teach you the morning. It's out of the Word of God. They also call it the Micah, the Micah principle or the Micah mandate. And it's not a requirement. I want you to know this morning, I'm not speaking to a specific group of people. Doesn't matter how long you've been saved. Doesn't matter where you come from. God is speaking to us this morning to align ourselves with the things of the kingdom. Let me read to you the message. Micah 6 verse 8 says, But he already made it plain how to live and what to do. What God is looking for in man and in woman. You can read Micah 6. It's a very, it's a very challenging chapter. It challenges the church. Although it's in the Old Testament, it's applicable to us this morning. And the message, I like how it just puts it out there. God already said. It's not going to say it again. Because many people want a revelation. They want a prophetic word to align them. Can I tell you, a prophetic word will not align you if your heart is hardened. How many of you have received prophetic words from really the guys that has the office of a prophet? And it doesn't align you because you're not in that space seeking to understand the kingdom living. God already said how to live, what to do, what is God is looking for in man and woman. It is quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbor. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. If you read the, if you read the Amplified, that last sentence, really, it really slaps you. Get over yourself. Don't be obnoxious. Don't be self-righteous. Let God be God. Just to bring context, Micah was a prophet about 700 years before Jesus was there. And the role of the prophet those times was to bring the correction. They, they were watchmen. They were lookers. They didn't have a crystal ball. They, didn't, they, they weren't in a little dark room with a crystal ball and smoked like this and you know, and you, and you oh, no. They, they knew the word. They, they had a relationship. God has called him. He, he, has, he has placed him in an office of the prophet. And they look, and what happens was, when they look at society, and they saw the gaps between what God wanted and how people behaved, the prophet intervened to help the people get back on the right path. So that was the role of Micah. That was his role. If you look at that scripture, you can understand what he's saying. He's looking to this people in front of him, and he sees what God wants for the nation, and he sees what people are doing. Now he's intervening with a prophetic unction. He says, guys, you know what God has said. He has told you what is good for you. Let me read to you the New King James. He has shown you, O man, what is good. Say good. 
So this message is not from condemnation. It is good to you. It is pleasant for your life if you apply it to your life. You know, I know they, if you're a chocolate lover like me, you cannot afford it anymore because the, the beans, the cocoa beans just went up and up and up and Ivory Coast is not producing anymore because of the uh, climate change and stuff. But my wife will say it's not good for you. I can't understand why it cannot be good for you if it tastes so good. <laughs> but yet a prophet is uttering a word. It says, it is good for you, son of man, to listen what God is saying. And what does the Lord require of you? That word require can be desire. Or, or if you want it in plain English, what can I do to please God? God has saved me, has redeemed me. And this is not to do with your salvation. It's not a salvation message. You are safe, you are born again. So this word, what does the Lord require of me? What can I do to please you, Lord? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. What does God require of us? Listen to this. To do justice. That has to do with our actions. Church, remember our scripture in Ephesians 3 that says that God speaks in Acts for His church. His presence is with us. So he has the question, what does God require of us? What can we do to please God? To do just. That's our actions. You must do it. To love mercies, that is our affections. The way you love, the way you act. We're human beings that has affections. We love to show it to people, how we appreciate people, how we value people, and then walk humbly. That is an attitude that you must have. You must have actions, you must have affections, and you must have an attitude, the right attitude. So God is addressing these three principles in our lives. The threefold conversion. The threefold transformation in the lives of the believer is to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is not a suggestion. It's not a mere option. These behaviors related to our actions, our affections, our attitudes are required of us. God says, I want this. I hope you can hear in the spirit. It's not optional. It's not when you feel like it. It's not like, but God understands where I am in my life. If you say you're church, you're born again, He says, I want you to act right, to have affections, to love right, and to be right with me. That is the whole thing, family. This threefold conversion, the metamorphosis, is what we as a church needs. We need it in our life. That conversion to Christ, that, that's your born again experience. That is the finished work of the cross. You understand you don't work for your salvation. You are saved by grace. God came to reach out to you in that desperate place in your life. You need to understand this. That's the first level of your conversion. Discovering your inclusiveness in a complete work of Jesus Christ. What a security this morning we have in Christ Jesus. He's not only the lover of your soul, he's the redeemer of your life. He's the caretaker of your, Holy, of your spirit through the Holy Spirit. Amazing. Then the conversion to live beyond ourselves. It is impossible for man to live beyond himself without the Holy Spirit. Because humanity by nature is self-righteous and self-centered. It's always what about me first. That's what happened with the fall of Adam. Instead of being God-focused, we became self-focused. So this threefold conversion is not only entitled with my born-again experience being in Christ. It also is affecting living beyond myself, sacrificing my comfort because I am the church of God. Do you know that church of God is not a comfort zone? The church of God stresses you. It pushes you into a place. The Bible says the love of God compels me. If you look at the Greek word of that, the love of God, it means to be taken by the scuff of your neck, if it's right in English, and by the belt of your pants, and be thrust forth. The love of God compels me, leaves you no choice. When God loves in you, you have no choice but to obey. Flesh cannot overrule the compelling love for Jesus Christ 
and Jesus for his people. Number three, the conversion to the public space, your world, where you function. So love God, love people, live with purpose. If you come into our church, you will see the Micah 6 verse 8 mandate. That's where that, that nice words, love God, love people, have come from, out of the Bible. Love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, love your neighbor as yourself, love people. We cannot love God without loving one another. That's what the Bible says. How can you love God that you cannot see, but your brother that you can't see, you cannot love? Don't deceive yourselves. The world will know that you're my disciples because you love one another. And now we have to reach out to our world this whole year, we're going to build confidence. We're going to build our spiritual man so that we can reach out to our worlds. Our world is a mess. Your family might be in a mess because something is happening. Your workspace might be a mess. There might be dark places around you. That's what the Bible says. You're the light and you're the salt. And I really believe this morning, guys, that God wants us just to realign ourselves as the body of Christ. Love God. Walk humbly with your God. I'm going to look at all three of these points separately. But I want you to understand, when I say I love God, it has an attitude, it has an action in my life to be humble, to, to be easy, to be bent, you know, just easy to bow down, easy to say I'm sorry, easy to love God, easy to obey, because your will has been broken. You know, we do it with children. We say, this is a strong-willed child. I need to bend these. Yeah. We, we, we say it in the natural. And then when you get born again, God says, I just want to bend you. I know you've got a personality like Paul, but I'm going to bend you a bit yeah. to be in my will for your life. Walk humbly. You know, family, if we can be humble, I want to tell you, we'll have a visitation of God like never before. In our nation, we all know this very beautiful scripture, It says, if my people who know my name will humble them themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. Walk humbly before. Love people. That is to love mercy, loving kindness, and then live with purpose. Do justly, impacting your world. When we say live with purpose, it means that you have a purpose in your society. You have a purpose in your world. You have a purpose in your family. And that's why God is calling you to impact it. How do we impact it? We impact it being humble, being full of the light. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, 26. So, I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. Say purpose in every step. That's, that, is, that is the Micah 6 mandate. I have a purpose in living. God, God had a purpose in saving you. We have my wife and myself, we were away this week and and uh, we said, we're not going to talk church. We, we're not going to talk church. We're just going to, I just fished and, and, and I just walked and we just had a time. But we find ourselves many times back in that space because church is our life. There's no other occupation but the body of Christ. Loving people, loving God, living with purpose. And we talked about that. What is the purpose of this house on this mountain. We have a scripture when you enter in that says in the last days, many people will say, let us come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord. Let us worship the Lord. Isaiah. It's a word, it's a scripture. But how's it gonna look in the last days? That purpose of the living church in our society. We've been praying for Job itself because that's where I live. I live in Alberton. It's part of Job itself for me. This house is how to enter our communities, how to change our world because I was never challenged. Maybe you, you grew up in church like me. You grew up with the Word of God and, and I would say 90% of the teachings from the pulpit was to tell you how to be holy so that God can love you more. It was just Scripture getting you in the right space. There was never a Scripture that challenged us to go beyond the walls of the church because we are the called out ones. So we say, don't look like the, like the world, don't smell like the world, and you sit in church and we just bombarded you with messages how you've been saved and what God wants to do in your life. It's all about us, the church. Now being many years later, 27 years later as a pastor, 
I'm thinking about life. I'm thinking about purpose. Because my life comes to a close in 20 or 30 years. And I want to look down the line and say, God, did I live with purpose? I loved you, but I love people, but have my community change. And that is why I asked this morning, has your world changed since you became born again? So we're going to turn it upside down, family. It's still the word of God. It is still God's word central in your, in your life. Who you are in Christ is your identity. But there must be an exit in loving mercy, loving people, and then to do justly. Do justly is going to be a challenge for us this year. But that's the pace and the place that we are the light and the salt of this earth. The Micah 6 mandate challenges the church to come out of that space of comfort into a place of destiny. Your destiny is not heaven. If you're born again, listen to me. Your destiny is booked. Heaven is your home. Amen. Don't worry about it. This is not salvation. But it's your purpose on earth. Why did God save you? And can I tell you this morning, with all great respect, He didn't save you just to go to heaven. He saved you to make a difference on earth. Amen. Jesus came down to heaven, walked this earth, and took 12 disciples, fishermen, and, 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 and Pharisees, and, and, and tax collectors, and He says, come follow me, I will make you a fisher of men. Would you allow God to make you something that you're not yet? It's still in His plan, but we're not there yet. I fight to win. I'm not just shadow boxing or playing around. See, the Micah 6 mandate reveals God's desire about you. What God sees, what God wants to do. He wants to connect your faith with your actions. Your faith needs to be covered by your actions. That's what James says, show me your faith, show me your actions. Show me actions, show me your faith. There's always, a, there's always a parallel between my faith and my actions. I can say I have this faith, but no actions. It's parallel, family. If you believe that God is the God of heaven, there should be a parallel in your, acts, in your actions that He is able to do what He says in your life. This is what this scripture is about. I'll care for those in need of our walk with God. What does the Lord require of you? But... But, and it's not a long list of doings. See, God's relationship with us is not religion. Religion is performance. Religion is the 12 steps, like the AA. You have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. And, and, and if you finish and you stick to that program, the serenity prayer, you might get sober. What God is saying this morning to us, family, that He wants to get involved in your life. And the only way to get involved in your life is the way you love Him. Because love gives you access. Because I love my wife, I, she has access to my life. I, 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 love, I love my daughter a little bit less, but she also has access. And the, the lesser the love, the lesser you have access. Amen. What is God, what the Lord require of you? But to do justice, love, kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Like I said, it's nothing to do with salvation this morning. It's a the simple description what God wants from us in return. God said, I've saved you, I've redeemed you, I've covered you with my blood, you redeemed, you're on your, sorry, on your way to heaven. Now I want you to do for me in return. Do justice. Love mercy and walk humbly with me. So let's look at the word walk humbly with God. Just turn it upside down. If you read Magi 6 verse 8, it's the last, to walk humble with God. But I've just turned it upside down because your relationship with God is in essence. The first thing God requires of you is relationship. That means involving God in everyday living. Remember when you just got saved? I've got saved in the 80s. In the 80s, there was a, there was a, a flow of, of holiness. It was a flow of power. It's a flow of, of dependence on God. And, and when we got born again, it was like, Lord, what must I wear this morning? 
Show me, Lord, what is acceptable for you, my clothes. Lord, which road must I take to work? Lord, who must I speak to? God was so involved. And then we grew up. We call it matured. But can I ask you this morning, is God still involved in the everyday living of your life? That walk with Him? See, when, when I say the word walk, it talks about a direction your life is taking. John Maxwell says, you know, if you think you're a leader and no one is following you, you're only going for a walk. But the Bible says, many is a plan in a man's heart, but God will direct their steps. So walk with God means I align myself in my steps to involve God in my living. Lord, what is your will for my life? Every day there's a cognitive understanding that this day is the day the Lord has made. And I must glorify Him in and through my life. I'm not a Christian on a Sunday and Monday I'm a worker for Talcom. Like, like Kenny, yeah? Shame. You all can say shame to Kenny. You know? And then, then, you know, I barely make it in Talcom and Friday. I, I, I can barely wait. And, and Sunday, praise God. Yeah. It should be differently, family. <laughs> Sunday should just be a celebration how God used you during the week. Sunday should be dancing in exhilaration how great God was answering your prayer for someone that gets healed and delivered. That is Sunday's about. It's not revitalizing the church. Come on, family. Walk with Jesus every day and revitalize you. It makes your Christianity alive. Well, your Christianity will be a program. It will be a gym session. I prayed an hour this morning. Now I'm finished. Take off my gym clothes, put on my work clothes. Don't talk to me about Christian. I'm at work now. No, nothing church now. Nothing church. You know, let's just work. No. Involve God in your everyday living. Be in step with Him. Let the God that loves your heart has your steps as well. Let God that has your heart has your feet as well, your dreams, your passions, your, your will. Do you know someone that inspired you? Someone that you knew that, that if you look at them, how they worship and how they live and you find them maybe in a restaurant, you find them in pick and pay, they're that same person. You see how God's love just permeates out of them. You look at them and say, wow. How do you do that? Is it in a smile? Is it in the clothes? Is it in a hairstyle? But I want that. When lost that someone in the natural caught you for a wow moment. So, wow, well, listen, I've seen this brother, man. And I know what he's going through. I know his wife has cancer maybe or this is that that happened. But look at him, man. He loves God. He loves God. He trusts God. He's that same person in church. Is that same person you meet Wednesday. In food lovers. That's what I'm talking about, family. That means that person that walked with God picked up the heart of God for society. Do you have the heart of God, family? If I say walk humbly of the Lord, do I have the heart of God? Because I understand that God is fully invested in you to change your world. By His grace and His mercy. God invested in you. He gave you a download from heaven. All things are possible for those who believed. It is inside of you that all things. He invested in you. But we need to cultivate our walk with God. Can I say this this morning? It's God that provides the power and the passion for us to be fully engaged. It's not of ourselves. It's not of ourselves. I found myself away this week and, and, and instead of engaging people, I, I withdrew and said, I don't want to see people. I don't want to see people. When it was too crowded in the swimming pool, I went to the cold pool. I don't even swim in my house in a cold pool. But I swam in a cold pool because there was about no one there. Thinking about, what am I preaching as a pastor? What am I living? Because I understand as a pastor, what I preach, I need to walk. You need to find me in a certain space. You cannot find me on holiday with a beer in my hand and say, listen, I'm on holiday. I'm not in church now. That's not right, family. God has my heart. And it's His power and His passion that allows me, that gives me the energy to engage in people's lives. It's not of my own. His, his love and His passion grounds me to the call that He's placed upon my life. 
I made a joke with someone who says, he says, how's church? I said, well, church is great without people. I'm, I'm glad you find it funny. He didn't find it funny at all. But I need to be grounded in that. That metaphor of walking in the same direction as God. Jesus, come and follow me. Walk in my steps and I will make you a fisher of men. We have to walk in the direction. John 1, 1 John says we are the light of this world. That's the revelation that his presence is within me. And then when I walk in this path, God is with me in this path because he has a destiny, a purpose in this. Walk humbly. Humbleness opens the encounter with the loving God. When you humble, God says, I resist the proud, but in the humble, the humble, the meek. Be humble. Can I ask you, don't fight for space. Salt never fights for space on the table. Doesn't matter where salt is on the table. Some will ask you, please pass me the salt. Don't have to be on the head of the table, or in the middle of the table, or somewhere on the table. Just be salt. You know, when you're light, people will be drawn to you. You don't have to wear a t-shirt, I glow in the dark, love Jesus. <laughs> just, just be authentic. Just do that walk, family. This morning, I'm sharing my heart with you as a pastor because I want you to enjoy your Christian walk on earth. Don't want you to be long-faced and drag your feet and say, wow, it's tough to be a Christian. Come, Jesus, come. Listen, let Jesus come when he comes. The Bible says, yes, every day, look up for your Redeemer is near. But don't wait to escape. Fill that space that God has filled you. Have direction in relationships. Connect in your spirit with the Lord God Almighty. And I really believe that God is going to do something great in your life. Number two, loving mercy. The condition of my heart changes to the extent to love what God loves. Loving kindness, mercy. Remember God says, for I love the world that I gave my son. We cannot excommunicate us from the world. I, I know, I know, family, I know your family is not saved, your workplace is not saved, and some, sometimes they curse, sometimes they use the word of God, the word of Jesus in profanity, and I know that. But that's where God wants you. That's where God wants you to make a difference in people's lives. That's the only way to influence when there's darkness. It's the only way to influence. The condition of my heart changes to extend to love what God loves. What does God love? God loves the world. Yes, He loves us. He says perfect love costs out fear. But God loved the world. We were in the world before we became saints. Amen. God loved you before you even got born again. He just loves you more now. He says you're my son and you're my daughter. You're part of my household. What I have is yours. I make everything available to you. Whatever is in heaven, it's yours on earth. Whatever is bound in heaven, is bound on earth. That's why we pray radical against sickness and disease and oppression and, 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 and all that strongholds of the enemy. I love that song the vet sang this morning. Where are you accuser now? Because the devil, devil accuses you, shames you, blames you that you're not worthy to be a child of God. That's why in your guilt, he gave you grace. Love, love mercy. Mercy, we know mercy says it's, it's receiving that we don't deserve. It's in that space that God wants to operate. To bring the goodness and kindness in my walk that I experience. If I experience God's goodness, to bring that kindness and the goodness into my situation, into my family, into my workspace. If I say God is good, none day God is good in my workplace because I experience His goodness. It's not doing something that, that you have not experienced. Look at Jesus. Jesus had a powerful relationship with His Father. We read about it in the Bible early in the morning He had fellowship with the Father. He does nothing if the Father doesn't show Him. All this, all this parallel and then there's an overflow of this relationship to this relationship with people. He valued people. Because people was the crown. He is still the crown of God's creation. And that's what Jesus asked of us this morning. He doesn't ask you more. He said that same loving relationship with the Father, that same walk, that same desire, that same passion, that same power. Let it just overflow into your loving people. 
Don't, don't have to do anything extra. Let it just spill over. Jesus just, that had love. He, he couldn't handle He couldn't keep it back. He couldn't handle it. It was, it was so thematically that he valued people, that the religious institution of that day was looking at him and says, he's a friend of the sinners. How can he drive out demons by the name? That's how natural it was for Jesus to love people. Love mercy. Some translation says kindness. And I know mercy and kindness is draw. Have you ever seen someone that's really kind? It, it draws you. It draws you to that person. You want, you want to say, well, how can you be so kind? You don't even know that person. How can you be so kind to me? You don't even know me. God says, listen, you want to draw people to you? Be kind, be loving. Have compassion for those in need. And I know it's not always easy. I know family, when you drive out there, we'll have people at a robot. Coming down from, from Hartbeers with them, each top street there were people begging for money. At one there was, a, there was an old man and I said to my wife, where is this guy's children? How can he have his dad standing in a heat 32 degrees of a board, help me please. And I know it's tough. As a pastor, I've been burned many times. Many, now I protect me with a board. Not to make the decisions because I've got a pastor's heart. I had a lady coming to church. She says, listen, I have cancer. And they, they hijacked me in my, in, my, in my driveway. And please, I just need 2,000 rand just to do this and this. And I gave it to her. And I never saw her. She gave me the wrong address. I said, listen, I call, come and pray. And Monday night, I'll come pray for you. She said, please, Pastor, come. They lived in Oak Dean. That's what the address they gave me. There's no, there was no such address when I went there. And that makes you hard, hard. But is it right? See, that's what God is asking us this morning. Because he says, you know, in a being this morning, he says, I hope you love mercy. For that is what you received from me. And as a pastor, I need to guard my heart many times, not too hard, my heart. Not to have a mind of judgment. Say, oh, they're fools, they made bad choices. How did they end here? They didn't, someone just didn't push them into that space. They choose to be in that space. And I had to repent in my heart, say, God, help me to have a soft heart for people. Even if I cannot change everybody's life outside there. But I have to love mercy. Say, love mercy. Family, we have to love mercy because there's a difference between kindness and niceness. Amen? Kindness is expression in action. Niceness is expression in words. There's a difference between kindness and niceness. Niceness involves superficial words and, and simple gestures. Let me, let me tell you, let me give you an ex example. Let's, for instance, say your neighbor is sick. Now you can choose to be a kind person or a nice person. A nice person will phone up the neighbor and say, Hi, I'm so sorry, I hear you're sick. And then because you're Christian, I will pray for you. Not with you, I'll pray for you. But you do what, know what a kind person will do? Reach out to that same neighbor, knock on the door and say, Listen, I know you're sick. Yes, I'm soup. Or can I go to the, to the shop and buy some groceries? What do you need? Kindness is an action, family. Niceness is superficial words. God is challenging us. What type of person are we going to be? What type of church are we going to be? Are we going to be nice people or are we going to be kind people? It's in the Old Testament. God had a name. Why God does what he does to people. And that Hebrew name is Chaset. Chaset is, was the operational manual how God reached out to people. Why he did because why he did to people was because of his Chaset. And that is what I'm challenging us this morning. What is required is telling us to do. God is telling us to do this morning unto others as He has done unto us. To love mercy. Have you received mercy? Give mercy. Don't evaluate. 
Have you loved me? Did you receive? Yes. That is God's chassid. He loved people, that's why he gave Jesus Christ. Even if people didn't respond to Jesus the way, he still loved. So look at God. God has been faithful to you. Be faithful to those around you. God has forgiven you. Forgiven those who hurt you. God has been patient with you. Display patience towards people around you. That is God's chassid. What I do to you, you do to people. Don't you think it will be easy to be a Christian? Because we pray so many times, Lord, what must I do? Lord, show me what I do. Lord, show me. Lord, what do I do? God, just do my chassid. What I do to you, you do to people. That's why I love the Bible. I love God. I love to interact, to understand. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. I know as a young believer, I put on the armor of God every morning. I took it off every evening because I want prayer. I did a lot of rituals. But coming more and more into maturity in Jesus Christ, the Bible says you've been clothed with Christ and you have the mind of Christ. So it's easy to be Christ-like. Just do what God did to you. And to do unto others that you don't want them to do unto you. God has intervened for you many times in your need. Show up for other people's in the times of their need. That is what God requires of you. Loving kindness. Is that okay, family? Love God. Love people. Walk humbly with your God. Love people. Have mercy. Loving kindness is the word in Hebrew. Chaset. Do unto others that you want them to do. The last one. And this is a tough one. Doing justice. We sang a song about God's revival in the streets, in our cities, in our neighborhoods. Do justice is, is tough because we need to stand up for stuff. And we don't want a protesting church, you know, walk around with banners. I hate people that, that is in this and this. That's what I'm talking about. Um, I'm talking about just to be light of this world because just to be light immediately place you into that place of battle because there's darkness. To do just is just to be light and to be salt. Just to be different. To, just to say something. Just to look different. Can I ask you this morning, what does your personal life look like with God? What, is, what does your family look like? Your wife and your kids. Do you leave a path in your relationship with God and with people for them to follow? Or are we that kind of people that, that when you ask someone that, why don't you serve the Lord Jesus Christ? That he will turn around and say, my parents were Christians. They, they went to church every day. But they weren't the same people at home. Yeah. They went to church. Do justice is, is just a place that where you work and, and the town that you stay. To define the word justice, to create a world where all people have equal opportunity to be fully to develop the gifts that God has placed within them. First as a church, it means live with purpose. Our mission statement is to ignite and empower a believer to live out the godly purpose that God has called you. Because I understand one day you're going to be in front of the beamer seat. And God's going to ask you and God's going to reward you because of your works done on earth. It's not over when you get to heaven. There's still the beamer seat. There's still the, the seat of God. You're not going to come before the seat of God. But to do justice is to look at people and say, how can I serve you to become what God called you to be? To make that playing field open. We are a multicultural church. We've got rich people, poor people, Indian people, white people. Doesn't matter what people you are, what race, what gender. Is to be in a just place that every person has a right to call him father. Doesn't matter the color of his breath. To do just. To be in that political arena, economic challenges we face. To be included in the most basic needs. You can ask me, Pastor, how can I be just? How can I? Maybe you're a teacher. And maybe you can invest your time on a Saturday morning to go to the, the, the urban places and teach kids to read. That is to do just. It's not their fault they're born into poverty. Maybe you're, you're, you're an artist or someone and maybe you can go to a space that it, it is, where there's darkness and be light in that space and teach kids 
young people, old people, how to worship God. Can I just read what I've put down here? Please don't stone me. You can ask me, Pastor, are you doing it? I say no. But God is challenging us as a church because I'm part of the church. I'm part of the body. I'm not the head. Jesus is the head. I've got a different function. I'm a preacher. And God has called me into the fivefold ministry where he says in Ephesians, and I've called and I've given unto the church some to be apostle, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and pastors. That is my call. I've done it in a small scale, maybe once or twice. But God is challenging us to influence our society. Justice is supporting an overwhelmed single parent who struggles to find the time and the resources to give adequate time to their children. Maybe you know someone in your neighborhood. There's a lot of people living in townhouses. Can I say how many people live in the townhouses next door? Well, maybe they're in the second so We've got quite a few people living in the townhouses next door. And maybe you see a single parent there struggling. Maybe you're the lucky one that can stay at home and the husband works. Get that kids into that space. Get him off the streets. Teach him about Jesus. Reach out to that. Just as he's taking a child from orphanage. I know a church where they're living this, the Micah 6 mandate. That people in the church adopted foster children. Because God convicted him. God has placed a burden upon them. It's above themselves to do it. I don't tell you to do it. I'm telling you, if you want to do just, there is a place to do just. What about a person that comes out of the prison because he made bad choices? Are we still going to treat him as a bad person? Or are we giving him a chance? That is to do justice. Justice is the host of other activities that levels the playing field and provides equal opportunity for us all. Doing justice also develop people. And in this house, we have... In the process of registering, we call it the Baseline Foundation, where business people can invest a certain amount for the tax deductible stuff into that situation, into that finance space. So we can start reaching out and do stuff like this. Can I be honest with you? Our natural budgets per month don't allow us to reach out in spaces. But we, we have this hunger, we have this desire, my wife and myself, with the leadership of this church, to have an influence on our community, to have influence in urban spaces. Can I tell you this morning, my desire as a pastor, although we are small, just to fight above our weight. I want to fight above our weight. We might be 150 people, 160 people, but I want to I wanna say, God, guys, let us, let us punch a hole in that place. Let's punch a hole in that rehab. Let's punch a hole into that society where, where God is, has no space yet. It's not simply just giving stuff away. It's also teaching people the principle to fish, to help them to help themselves because that's sustainable. We come from Ayrton, there's a lot of places that take care of the homeless people. And when you enter that space, you will see the greenhouses where they, they have to do their own, their own greens. They, they plant their own vegetables and they have their own chickens. That's what I'm talking about. In our daily lives, to have an opportunity to do just with our actions, to help people to help themselves. Can you hear my heart this morning, family? The Micah 6 mandate is not for the church to be in a comfort zone. The Micah 6 mandate is to love God and to love people and to live with purpose. You live with purpose in your society, in your workspace, in your family, in your community where there's need. Maybe you live close to a park. Maybe you can take an hour on a Saturday just to walk through that park and to pray with people, just to touch them. You know, people that's homeless, they're not used to touch. They're not used to people having their private space because they don't smell that well. Maybe you can just go there and buy them some slop chips and a ration, man. And leave a seed about Jesus. You'll never know where the guys will end up. I listened to a story in this, this week where, where the this, this son was, a, the, the, the pastor, the pastor had a son that, and the son went into a rehab 
the first time because of addictions. And he came out clean. And he went back again. And how that father keep on loving him. Today he's also a pastor in the ministry. But just think about it, father giving up on that son of his and say, listen, you've been in rehab, boy. You don't want to change. You know, you don't. You just go and do what you want to do. That's what I'm talking about this morning. Not to have that mindset. Because if you love God and you love people, you've got no choice but to do just. To stand up for what is right. To create this environment where people can thrive and achieve because of their full potential. The inside out approach of Jesus. Next slide, Pooh. The inside out approach of Jesus. That is transformation begins by knowing God, loving people, live with purpose, influencing the society around you. That's the Micah mandate. Love God because He loves you so much. Love people. Do to people what God did to you. Live with purpose. I want to ask you, find a purpose. Maybe, maybe you're a counselor. Put time out there. In this house we do TPM. Transformational prayer ministry. Put your time out there and say, listen, if you need counseling, I'm willing, free of charge, come and see me. Do just. Live with purpose. Because there is inclination. If you're a leader, you, you will read about leadership in the Bible and you will teach leaders to be leaders. And if you're a worshiper, you will read about worship in the Bible and it will be a passion for you to teach people worship. And if you're a teacher in the Bible, you have a passion to teach. You know, I understand that. Maybe that can be your purpose. Reaching out to people that needs your gift, your talent, your time your treasure is that okay family some questions we're not going to talk about it but I want you to take a picture of this please if you have your phone please if you have a photographic memory take a snapshot I didn't see Martin at the back he usually sits there this morning he sits there but there's some questions I want you to meditate upon this week. Because that will keep this teaching alive in your spirit. What does the Lord desire of you? What gifts and abilities has He given you for that? How can you step outside of your comfort zone to other areas that the Lord may desire for you? What are the ways you can make the Micah 6.8 an action in your life? I hope this morning no one is under condemnation. We as a church are being challenged. I know you love God. And I know you love people. But do not finish it. There's a threefold conversion that we need to abide to. It's not only about you and God. It's not only about God in you. It's about us being purposefully in our space that God has called you to. Agents of change. Agents of hope. Can I tell you something? Our world needs hope. They need hope. Hope of a better future. And we have this hope. Christ in us, the hope of glory. This hope saved, it's not our same hope that I say, I hope it's going to rain tomorrow. We know this hope is constant. That God still saved no matter the hour. God still heals no matter the disease. God still shows up no matter the crisis. That's the hope we have in our human being. So may God bless you this morning. And I thank you for receiving this word with, with all diligence. Because I want you to prosper in a place where God has planted you. Don't be, and Afrikaans we say a torbos. Don't be one of those bushes that has no reeds, no, 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 no roots. Be a palm tree. Be that tree in Psalm 1 that even if the wind blows, you'll still be rooted in Christ. Doesn't matter what happens to us. It happens within us that changes our society. Amen. Will you give God praise for His word this morning, family?